Hey everyone! Welcome back to another episode of the History of Video Games. This time we are going to be looking at the rise and fall of a magic. It's not a very long story, but it is pretty interesting and it did contribute a little bit to video game history. It was a very interesting company which sort of came about after Atari was, well, being a terrible company. So let's pick up with Imagic and how they started out. Imagic was founded in 1981 by Rob Fulop. He was a former Atari employee, and, you know, he did a similar thing to what Activision did. While the company only existed for five years, they still had a pretty significant impact, so much so that Atari felt the need to sue them over one of their games being so similar to another game that they had the home console rights to. Imagic holds the distinction of being the second third-party developer for the Atari 2600. Now let's take a look at a few of their cartridges and just see how they compare to really the Atari 2600 and also to Activision's. You can see a little bit of the labels here. Activision has those bright silver labels with a little bit of a rainbow scheme on them, whereas Atari would change theirs from sort of like the plain black sort of basic ones to more of like a gaudy art style. Activision used more of, you know, realistic graphics. A Magic would eventually change theirs to have more of an art style similar to Atari's. Let's take a look at a few of the other games that they made, because Magic didn't just release games for the Atari, they released for a bunch of systems like the Intellivision and the ColecoVision. They also did for a few computers as well. It's kind of weird, I think they should have expanded more because they didn't really go into the Apple computers too much. At the time Imagic was around, there were really three major consoles out. The Intellivision, the ColecoVision, and the Atari 2600. Well, Imagic released games for all three of these, and they did go into some of the computers, they didn't really capitalize on Apple as much as they really should. And that's one of the reasons why they kind of fell apart, that and the video game crash, and also some of the lawsuits they incurred. So how exactly did a magic really come into existence? Well, it happened the same way that Activision did. Atari, who was famously known for being just absolutely terrible to their programmers, initially chased a group of people away and they formed Activision. Atari would sue Activision because they didn't think that Activision should be able to release games for their system. And because Activision won that lawsuit, and also because Atari was still kind of crappy, a magic came into being. Now, a magic got sued by Atari not because of them releasing games, but because they released a game called Demon Attack. And Atari felt that this was very similar to a game they were going to release called Phoenix. You can see that both games look pretty similar. Demon Attack and Phoenix, they play about the same. Both are space shooters, both have a bunch of kind of weird bird-like enemies in them every once in a while. But what Phoenix does is actually have some boss fights for you. It also has a few more sprites on the screen than Demon Attack. Uh, personally, I like Demon Attack more, but that's just my own, you know, my own personal feeling. Basically what happened was Atari bought the rights to release Phoenix as the home console port. A Magic decided they were going to make Demon Attack. As far as I can tell, they were made totally separate from each other. Both games got released in 1982, and, you know, they... Here, here it is, so I guess the lawsuit didn't have a huge impact. It was settled out of court, so I don't know exactly what was, you know, the agreement between the two sides. The lawsuit does remind me a little bit of how Atari would go after pretty much everybody that made a Pac-Man port, and it feels a similar way, where they just kind of wanted to throw their weight around. A Magic released about 25 games during its five years, so averaged about five a year. Most of these games are pretty similar, you just get a lot of space shooters, and they all have pretty colorful graphics for the time. 
once you got to the Intellivision and a few of the computers, you got better games out there, which is really nice, and I kind of wish they would have been able to bring some of those over to the Atari 2600, but the system probably just couldn't handle it, to be perfectly honest. It was pretty clear from just going over all the games that Imagic had and reading as much information as I could about them, they had a lot of talent there, and they could have made some really amazing games if they had more of a chance. I think some of the things that held them back are just the fact that they didn't branch off into the Apple computers, and also it didn't seem like they were really ready for the video game crash when that happened. Not that anybody was really ready for it, but it feels like they got hit a little bit harder than most companies. When I was doing some more research on this, it kind of felt like I was reading the story of Apollo Games, or Games by Apollo, or whatever the hell they want to call themselves. With the exception of Magic actually being a pretty good company and having a lot of talent behind it. Today, a lot of their rights are held by Activision, which is kind of fitting. It's like it came full circle and Activision bought up what... Uh, at least what was left of Atari, it was at least some of the good parts that were left of Atari in a magic. That's pretty much all I got for you guys today. I, I hope you enjoyed the episode. It's a short and sweet story, but it's kind of a wild ride for this company. Just five years and then they were gone. Anyway, please let me know what you think in the comments below and have a great day, everybody.